According to legend, long before the dawn of civilization, there lived a people of advanced technology, government and imperial ambitions. They inhabited an island continent called Atlantis until it was suddenly destroyed. But did it ever really exist? 2,300 years after this tale was first told, people are still searching for clues to Atlantis and the mysterious people that lived there. I believe Atlantis is real, but I believe it was an actual civilization. The civilization was destroyed and there are remnants of that culture or civilization spread throughout the planet. Do the ruins of Atlantis still lie on the sea floor? And did Atlantean survivors teach the Egyptians how to build the pyramids or lay the foundations of the Mayan world? Did they change human history with technology beyond their time? The Atlanteans may have even had computer and television. Or was an ancient disaster behind the legendary tale? As far as I know, there is no legitimate evidence that suggests Atlantis was real. We examine the evidence with believers and skeptics alike as we go in search of the elusive lost continent of Atlantis. The legend of Atlantis has captured the modern imagination like few other myths. It was the most fertile of plains with a palace in the middle, surrounded by alternating moats of land and sea, a continent said to be the size of Asia and Libya combined. It was an island paradise created by the offspring of the Greek god Poseidon, and for many generations it was a sophisticated, egalitarian and peaceful land. The Atlanteans were an honorable people who worshipped bulls, walked with elephants and feasted on coconuts. But as their godlike qualities diminished and human nature took over, they became warlike and greedy. Then in the course of a single day and night after a series of earthquakes and floods, Atlantis sank to the bottom of the sea. It's a great story, but is it history or pure imagination? Some people are convinced that Atlantis is real. Most people believe that Atlantis is simply a myth or a story, but I believe it was an actual civilization. I think that there were some Atlanteans who survived the catastrophe that drowned most of what is now Atlantis. There are two main groups of Atlantis advocates, those looking for the lost continent itself and those who believe that survivors of Atlantis left their mark on many of history's ancient monuments. But they all start with Plato, the Greek philosopher, who around 360 BC wrote a book of sorts about the lost continent of Atlantis. It took the form of two philosophical dialogues called Timaeus and Critias. To some people, these writings represent a treasure map passed down for generations. Many have followed it and come up with some vastly different conclusions as to the location of Atlantis. This is largely because Plato's landmarks are very difficult to interpret. He describes Atlantis as situated in front of the straits which are called the Pillars of Heracles. Tradition holds that the Pillars of Heracles are actually the Strait of Gibraltar at the mouth of the Mediterranean. But there's a whole world outside this strait. Some people believe that nearby islands such as the Azores or the Canaries might fit the bill as the remnants of Atlantis. But people have suggested this elusive utopia is located in just about every place on Earth, including Antarctica, the South China Sea, Ireland, Spain, the Americas, the Andes Mountains, and even at the bottom of a lake in the Dominican Republic. Did Atlantis actually exist? Well, Plato doesn't say yes or no. He acts as if it did and gives us an incredibly detailed description of everything that uh, is in the land of Atlantis, that it's an island, that it's got concentric rings of uh, water and earth, so you go earth, then water, then earth, then water, uh, with the passageway in between so boats could get in there. 
Despite having a map and a description, Atlantis hunters have not yet managed to locate the ruins of Atlantis itself. But tracking the supposed survivors has yielded some interesting results. Some believers think there are Atlanteans who survived the catastrophic event that destroyed their world, and that they washed ashore in some far-flung places, bringing their superior knowledge to some of the world's new and emerging cultures. For Atlantis believers, there's no better evidence of this than the awe-inspiring monuments of ancient Egypt. They argue that an undeveloped population couldn't have suddenly begun to create such spectacular structures. They couldn't have mastered the complex mathematics required or carved such perfect angles with copper tools. The answer must be that the Egyptians had help. Author and tour guide William Henry is a vocal proponent of this theory. He's brought a group of 35 believers to Egypt to examine the evidence firsthand. The Valley Temple at Giza is a remarkable piece of work. It was constructed from hundreds of limestone blocks encased with red granite slabs, many exceeding 150 tons in weight, three times the size of the largest stones at Stonehenge. The Atlanteans, according to the ancient records, say that they brought these stones here from over 600 miles away. How did they do that? William Henry has one idea. The answer that's been proposed is that they must or might have had some form of anti-gravity technology that made that not as light as feather, but almost. It enabled them to manipulate it, lift it in the air and move it about, place it whatever, wherever they liked. Anti-gravity technology seems pretty far-fetched. But hieroglyphs found at the Temple of Abydos might indicate that the Egyptians were aware of technology we think of as decidedly modern. Could these pictures represent a helicopter, a submarine, and even a UFO? And could they perhaps explain how the Atlanteans managed to travel the world? Because, according to believers, Atlantean architects worked on everything from the temples at Angkor Wat in Cambodia to the statues on Easter Island. They even made it to the Americas. In Mexico, local legends have long told of bearded white gods who came from beyond the sea. One man thinks that those visitors may in fact have been Atlanteans and that they gave the Maya a helping hand in building their majestic temples. Anthropologist and author George Erickson has studied the Maya for 30 years, and he's noticed something seemingly impossible at the temples of Uxmal and Cujumlich. Plato wrote about the presence of elephants in Atlantis. People have said, well, there could, have been, could not have been any elephants in the Americas. Yet here in the middle of the Yucatan Peninsula, we find an elephant with its forehead, the eyes of the elephant, and a perfect carving of an elephant trunk. Some archaeologists have called this a stylized macaw, but this is no parrot-like bird. This is the trunk of an elephant. But some anthropologists suggest the elephant is in the eye of the beholder. Plato's compelling account of a doomed civilization called Atlantis has fanned the imaginations of readers for centuries. But it wasn't until the modern age that a congressman named Ignatius Donnelly brought it back into the limelight. Born in Philadelphia in 1831, Donnelly was a believer in the possibility of a perfect society. He even helped to found a utopian town called Nininger City in Minnesota, only to have it fail almost immediately. Undaunted, he wrote a book called Atlantis, the Antediluvian World. In his mind, Atlantis was the Garden of Eden, the root of every successful ancient civilization, and the origin of Greek gods and goddesses. Donnelly located Atlantis around the Azores. People believed what he said. This was in the middle of the 19th century. And he said, this is what I found. 
archaeology was a, was a nascent science at that point. If he said this was so, a lot of people thought, why not? Could be. The idea of Atlantis then caught on in Germany in the early 1900s, where a secret society called the Tula sent expeditions all over the world in an effort to find evidence of an Aryan race. They believed that the home of the Aryan race was none other than Atlantis, which they pinpointed somewhere near Greenland and Iceland. During World War II, Adolf Hitler reportedly ordered the infamous Luftwaffe to divert from its wartime missions and search for Atlantis. But the person who really put Atlantis back on the map was the extraordinary self-proclaimed psychic Edgar Cayce. He claimed to have had visions of a continent which had gone through three major periods of physical division and had been left as a group of islands, probably in the Caribbean. According to Casey, its citizens built laser-like crystals for power plants, which eventually overcharged, causing a terrible explosion. Casey also claimed to have had a vision in which he learned that the Sphinx had been built in 10,500 BC, 8,000 years earlier than general scientific opinion places it, and that the survivors of Atlantis had concealed beneath it a hall of records containing all the wisdom of their lost civilization and the true history of the human race. Casey predicted that proof of the existence of Atlantis would be found in the Bahamas in 1968 or 1969. And sure enough, in 1968, pilots flying over the island of Bimini spotted this structure from the sky. One and a half kilometers of stone organized into what is now referred to as the Bimini Road. Some people believe it's an ancient man-made breakwater that enclosed a harbor. Years later, another similar structure was found off the island of Andros, and this was dubbed the Andros Road. The Caribbean is about six and a half thousand kilometers from the Pillars of Heracles at the mouth of the Mediterranean, but the Bahamas' theory nonetheless attracted a lot of attention. Among the believers in a Caribbean Atlantis, few are as passionate as George Erickson. I believe that the Bemini Road and the Andros Road are related to my concept of Atlantis because this is part of the Bahama Bank, which would have been above water, and part of the island continent of Atlantis. At the time, Plato ascribes to Atlantis' destruction. Just as the elephant sculptures at Ushmal seem out of place to him, so too do some of the magnificent carvings at the Maya ruin of Kuhunlich. Erickson scales the Temple of the Masts, a pyramid with a central stairway flanked by huge stone faces. He believes that this particular mask is a sure sign that non-Maya people were here before the temple was constructed and that someone carved their likenesses on the pyramid. This is a Mayan stucco face of the rain god Chak, but it has Atlantean features, a long face, a square jaw, definite mustache, curly mustaches on either side, high brow, long aquiline nose, we can't possibly know for sure what the Atlanteans looked like, but according to Erickson, we do know what they didn't look like, and they didn't look like the Maya. The Mayans didn't have facial hair. They were round-faced, and they were shallow-faced. Erickson has come back to collect more evidence, hoping to prove his theory that the Maya were not the first people to live on the Yucatan Peninsula. Conventional archaeologists have long believed that the first people to colonize the Americas followed large game across a land bridge from Siberia to Alaska and then migrated south. But George Erickson believes that the ancient Atlanteans reached the Americas even earlier. He suggests that towards the end of the last ice age, the Yucatan Peninsula, Cuba and the Bahamas were all larger than they are now, a fact that science corroborates. Thank you. 
but he goes on to say that something cataclysmic caused the planet's ice to melt, leading to the rising seas that drowned Atlantis. I believe that the cataclysm that destroyed Atlantis was the result of a great flood. But that flood itself was the result of something like an asteroid or comet striking the Earth. While geologists agree that sea levels were rising about 10,000 years ago, there's no evidence of a major asteroid or comet strike in the Caribbean at this time. But Ericsson remains firm in his beliefs. I believe Atlantis is real. There are some silly claims about Atlantis that can be easily discounted. However, that there was a seagoing civilization that pioneered architecture, art, concepts of mathematics, and concepts of social interaction that led to a golden age. I believe this has existed and that it was destroyed by a flood and that is still with us in the Mayan presence in Central America. But mainstream archaeologists and anthropologists suggest that questioning the intellect and capabilities of the Maya is scientifically unnecessary, not to mention a bit insulting. As anthropologist Jeff Blomster explains, There's always been interesting theories about people coming outside of the New World to teach the indigenous people how to develop culture or how to build their cities. And to me, it seems somewhat ethnocentric. It suggests that the people of the New World couldn't have done this themselves, that they needed some kind of outside help from the Old World. And the reality is there's absolutely no evidence for that. According to ancient records, some indigenous people in Central America did tell tales of visits from godlike white seafarers. Evidence of their actual existence is thin. But in Egypt, some people believe that hieroglyphs on the walls of temples constitute hard evidence of just such people. Could the Atlanteans have come here to teach the Egyptians how to build the Sphinx and the pyramids? And could they have left records of their endeavors in libraries under the Sphinx itself? Many Atlantis believers think that all roads lead to Egypt. The Stargate of the Gods Tour, led by William Henry, comes here not just to wonder at the wisdom of the ancient Egyptians, but also to question whether such an early civilization could have erected such perfect structures on its own. The reason people come on the Stargate of the Gods Tour is because they sense that they, they haven't been told the whole story. And what they want to do is expand their imagination, look at the, the same evidence that others are looking at from a slightly different perspective, and then to experience the temples themselves and see with their own eyes what everybody's so excited about. The group takes a boat down the Nile to the majestic Temple of Horus at Edfu. The best preserved temple in Egypt, it was completed in 57 BC and was dedicated to the falcon-headed god Horus. Like many temples in Egypt, its history is written on its walls. William Henry shows us what he believes is physical proof of the existence of Atlantis. What we're looking at are, are texts at the Edfu Temple that tell the story of the original extraterrestrial beings that came to Earth and created the original island on Earth that is very similar to Plato's story about Atlantis. In fact, I think what we see here at this temple are the source texts that Plato used when writing the story about Atlantis. Plato did say that Egyptian priests were the source for his tale of Atlantis. But this temple wasn't in fact constructed until decades after Plato had died. Still, the temple is just one piece of the puzzle according to the tour leaders. They also suggest that the Sphinx, the Valley Temple and the famous pyramids are not mere monuments. They are also hard evidence that Atlanteans once lived in Egypt. Most Egyptologists believe that this colossal limestone half-lion, half-man was built around the same time as the pyramids, in approximately 2500 BC. But William Henry believes that it must have been built much earlier, 
He subscribes to Edgar Cayce's theory that a hall of Atlantean records was built beneath the Sphinx closer to 10,000 BC. And he suspects that the Atlanteans hid records there after supervising the construction of the Sphinx. Nobody knows for sure what is buried underneath here, but it's widely speculated, and, and some of it is affirmed by scientific evidence that there are chambers beneath here, just as portrayed here on the Sphinx stele. Casey prophesied that this hall of records would be rediscovered and opened between 1996 and 1998. So far, it's a few years behind schedule. But many people still believe that it exists, including engineer Bill Brown, who has made finding the Hall of Records his life's goal. Brown has spent many weeks charting maps of the area using GPS and ground-penetrating radar, and he thinks he's found something. I came here with evidence that we would find something underground here. We have that evidence now, and what we have found here is a device, 30 two feet underground, a cavern that has been verified. The cavern is to a depth that we have right now of 125 feet. It's full of mud, and within that mud are some casings. Whether or not these casings hold Atlantean records, Brown's convinced he's on the verge of making a major discovery. The Halls of Records is about the Atlantean race. It's the history of Atlantis before it fell, why it fell, and it was left for us as a lesson to learn so that we might not make the same mistake. While in Egypt, the Stargate of the Gods tour had hoped to be present when Bill Brown broke ground in search of the Hall of Records, but permission to dig has yet to be granted, so instead they take a special tour inside the Great Pyramid. Could the Atlanteans really have come to Egypt and built these ancient structures? And if so, how did they get here? Henry thinks the answer may be found in a place called Abu Jurab. It's off the tourist track about an hour from the Giza Plateau and is the location of the ruins of two Fifth Dynasty Sun Temples. But William Henry believes there's more to it than that. We're headed to Abu Ghraib, one of the most ancient ceremonial centers on the planet. Ancient Egyptian tradition says that star beings came through this place. They call it, a, locally, they call it a UFO landing base. But I think the Atlanteans came here through stargates. They are the star beings. Henry believes that the Atlanteans were born in the constellation of the Pleiades, and that they came to Earth through stargates, hypothetical structures used to travel through space and time. And he thinks that one of the very first places they landed was Abu Jirab. Very few people know about it, but now what we're beginning to discover is that it might have immense significance in the Atlantis theory. Henry walks across the deserted sand to what looks like the remnants of a building or altar. If we put our hand across here, we notice this rounded edges. It's perfectly smooth. Some believe this is evidence of advanced machining in the ancient world. How could you have done this with copper chisels? That's what Egyptologists believe this was made with. But that doesn't make any sense. I mean, the precision here, the smoothness is just absolutely unbelievable. But the scientific community holds a different view. Egyptologist Salima Ikram is an expert on mummies and has been studying ancient Egypt for over 20 years. And she takes exception to the idea that aliens built the treasures of ancient Egypt. There seems to be an inability to appreciate the fact that people who lived here were capable of doing all of these things themselves without external help. And um, it is insulting. There is, in fact, a wealth of archaeological evidence that records in minute detail how the pyramids were constructed by Egyptians. And many historians and scientists suspect that the story of Atlantis is just that, a story. But, as with many myths, it may have had a historical source. 
and many think that the place and people that inspired Plato may have been right in his own backyard. If you're going to put Atlantis anywhere, it has to be in what we call the Old World. It has to be in the Mediterranean area or just off the coast of Spain or somewhere in the region that Plato would have been familiar with. Many people following Plato's description of Atlantis as outside the Pillars of Heracles assume that a lost continent must have been beyond the Strait of Gibraltar or somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. But Plato's world was the Mediterranean. So what if the Pillars of Heracles were local landmarks, just a short boat ride away from the Greek mainland? And what if, beyond them, there was an island nation, an advanced civilization with an organized government, international trade routes, and a formidable army, a nation that was suddenly destroyed by a cataclysm so huge it sent shockwaves throughout the entire region? Such a place did exist. Between 3000 and 1100 BC, the first true European civilization thrived on the islands of Santorini and Crete. They were called the Minoans, and they were a peaceful, athletic and artistic people years ahead of their time. Their famous palace at Knossos on Crete even had a form of indoor plumbing. By all accounts, this was a highly advanced civilization. Is it possible that the Minoans were the inspiration for Plato's cautionary tale? And what brought about the decline of their civilization? Science may have the answer. Around 1640 BC, 1,300 years before Plato put pen to paper, a massive volcanic eruption tore apart the tiny Greek island of Santorini. A large part of the island sank under the waves and took with it a small outpost of the highly civilized Minoans. In 1939, Greek archaeologist Sporoidon Marinatus excavated part of Santorini to see if other lost pockets of Minoan culture might still be found buried under centuries of dirt and ash. And sure enough, he found one. Preserved by volcanic ash was the fabulous city of Akrotiri. He found a very advanced city. Akrotiri was a city with houses and with storage areas for grain and wine, and of course the most fabulous decorations that it is possible to imagine. It was destroyed in essentially a day and a night by a massive explosion of the volcano on which it was sighted. And so the site of Akrotiri actually fits Plato's description quite well. Professor Maranatos speculated that the fate of Akrotiri may have formed the basis for Plato's tale of Atlantis. Geologist Floyd McCoy thinks he was onto something. What's being talked about here is something that was abruptly gone. Something that has exploded, essentially. Well, that's the only thing we know of in nature that could do that so grandly has to be a volcanic eruption. The eruption on Santorini was as massive as the famous explosion on Krakatoa in Indonesia in 1883, and almost 10 times greater than the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980. Floyd McCoy heads out by motorboat into the caldera, the giant crater that was created by the collapse of the central part of the volcano. More than 3,600 years after the catastrophic eruption, evidence of this volcano's awesome power still remains. And according to McCoy, it's just a matter of time before history repeats itself. This is ground zero for today. This is where the eruptions are focused. This is this volcano rebuilding itself. Give it 20,000 years, what's going to be here? There's going to be a huge island here. It's going to be large, enormous. And then it'll look like it did in the Bronze Age, perhaps, without bare rock like this, but with soil 
trees, maybe bushes and people. Signs that the volcano is alive and potentially dangerous are everywhere. Okay, that is, that's hot. That's hot gas coming out, ow, hot. And the yellow is sulfur, the white sulfur oxide. That is heat coming out of the ground. Where's the heat coming from? The heat's coming from magma, liquid rock deep underneath here. This is a deceiving landscape. For any volcanologist, this says there's active magma under our feet. This thing could erupt at any moment. There's no question that this volcano violently destroyed Akrotiri. But how could it have brought down the entire Minoan civilization, centered on Crete more than 100 kilometers away? As a little boy growing up on Crete, engineer Kostas Sinolakis was fascinated by the power of the sea. He now specializes in one of the most devastating of ocean phenomena, tsunamis. And he knows better than most that tsunamis can be caused by huge volcanic eruptions. We don't really know scientifically exactly what happened to Santorini. But, um, you know, we have a hypothesis, and this is how science works. Uh, we think that the volcano basically blew up, and uh, the entire Santorini was destroyed. With the collapse of the volcano, a huge tidal wave was triggered, and the tidal wave, the tsunami, traveled all the way to Crete, and it severely impacted the Minoans. And uh, Sandorini, in ancient times, was you know, the, trade, the trading center uh, of the Mediterranean. It was like a modern uh, Hong Kong, if you will. The last few years have brought home the destructive power of deadly waves. Tsunami in the Indian Ocean in 2004 killed an unimaginable 225,000 people. And here in the Mediterranean five years earlier, a tsunami devastated parts of Turkey. The idea of a city that disappears uh, underneath waves is not far-fetched at all. We saw it in 1999 uh, during the Great Izmit earthquake that killed 17,000 people, gone. So were the Minoans the model for Plato's Atlanteans? And is Akrotiri, destroyed by a volcano that blew itself to bits, the real Atlantis? Clearly, details of what happened here in 1640 BC closely parallel the story of Plato's lost civilization. The advanced society, its sudden disappearance, the geography of Santorini, and its land of red and black volcanic rock. Could Minoan refugees perhaps have told their horrific tale on mainland Greece, passing it down from generation to generation until it reached Plato's inquisitive ears? The circumstantial evidence is compelling, but any hard evidence, if it ever existed, may be lost forever. So was this Atlantis? That's really hard. Atlantis is a story. Was the story here? Was this a location for that story? That's very hard to say. Impossible. It's a wonderful story. I'd love to believe it, but I'm a scientist. I need to see some hard evidence. It's not there yet. Many scholars are convinced that Atlantis and Akrotiri are one and the same. The true story of a sophisticated society wiped out on the Greek islands, almost literally in a day and a night, would have survived and resonated with the classical Greek culture to come, and with its greatest teacher, Plato. If you want an advanced civilization living in the area where Atlantis should have been, the Minoans are probably going to be your best bet. But can science explain the startling evidence that godlike beings lent a helping hand to young civilizations like the Egyptians and the Maya? Can it reveal the meaning of those startlingly modern-looking hieroglyphs? 
And what about the strange, incongruous carvings that seem to defy earthly explanation? The tale of the magical, utopian island continent of Atlantis, with its profoundly sophisticated people and its cataclysmic disappearance, has fascinated people for centuries. Even skeptics love the story. Atlantis is one of the great enduring mysteries of our time. But was it survivors of Atlantis, or their extraterrestrial cousins, that designed and built the great monuments of ancient civilizations? The Giza Plateau and the Yucatan Peninsula are among the most intensely excavated and dissected places on Earth. And nowhere has any evidence been found that people hailing from Atlantis were responsible for their buildings. Still, there are some intriguing anomalies that have yet to be explained. The most eye-catching, perhaps, are the hieroglyphs at Abydos in Egypt, what some have seen as a helicopter, a submarine and a UFO. Could the Egyptians have had foreknowledge of such things? In fact, these figures are simply the result of re-carving. Originally, the temple at Abydos was dedicated to the pharaoh Seti, but in later years, inscriptions praising Ramses II were carved over the old ones. Some of the plaster also broke off over time, and the characters assumed these odd, accidental shapes. Separate out the various glyphs carved at various times, and the mysterious extraterrestrial technology disappears. But there's still the matter of what lies under the Sphinx, where famed psychic Edgar Cayce said we'd find the Atlantis Hall of Records. Do Bill Brown's ground-penetrating radar images really show they're there? The Halls of Records do exist. I, I believe they exist today, and that uh, in the near future, we're going to be able to prove that fact. Egyptologists aren't holding their breath. They've dug many deep holes here all to no avail. I know that a lot of people have been questing for the Hall of Records and for the Atlantean secrets that lie beneath the paws of the Sphinx. But so far, despite drilling and sort of doing surveys, no one has found any evidence for this. So, um, you know, maybe they will find it in the future, but I rather doubt it given the amount of work that has been done on that so far. Until we find the Hall of Records, it seems we should give the ancient Egyptians credit for some of the most remarkable pieces of architecture in the ancient world. Why do we need someone from outer space to come and make something when the people who lived here were perfectly able to do it themselves? Can the same thing be said about the Yucatan? Anthropologist George Erickson firmly believes that the moustached men and elephant-like trunks on Maya temples are proof of an ancient Atlantean culture. You know, there are many clues in the Yucatan that make me believe that the Atlanteans came here and inspired and instilled their civilization and their concepts in the Maya. But Maya expert Jeff Blomster disagrees. There's absolutely no evidence that the people who first populated Yucatan were seafarers from a place called Atlantis in the Caribbean. So how do we explain the unusual masks at Cahun Leach? The mask at Cahun Leach shows the Mayan sun god, Kanish Ahau. Sometimes that sun god is shown with scrolling elements on either side of his mouth. It could represent smoke or steam. Some people suggest it represents serpents. On top of that, it turns out that the Maya did have facial hair themselves. So the idea that the Mayans don't have facial hair is an unfortunate misunderstanding, I believe. I think if you go into any Mayan community today in Mexico or Guatemala, you'll see Mayans who have facial hair. So certainly they grew facial hair. What about the elephant trunks at Uxmal? Do these prove that Atlantean elephants once roamed the Americas? The masks are not showing elephants whatsoever. What they're showing are a series of features from the Mayan world, actual creatures that were combined 
into these supernatural images. So for example, sometimes these uh, snouts represent bird beaks. Sometimes they could even represent reptilian snouts. Uh, and even tapirs would have been known to the Mayan. Oceanographer Richard Ellis doesn't think there's much truth to Ericsson's theory that a comet caused a flood to destroy a Caribbean Atlantis. My feeling about Atlantis and the Caribbean is that it's ridiculous. Um, the geology and the formation of islands in the Caribbean, of Mexico, of Cuba, are very, very well known, and they have nothing whatever to do with a big hunk of real estate that sank. South America also seems pretty far removed from Plato's frame of reference. Could Atlantis be in the Yucatan? Atlantis could be anywhere you want to put it. Is it likely to be there? No, I don't think so. Most likely is that Atlantis should be located somewhere in a region where Plato would have been familiar with. Somewhere like the Greek island of Santorini, perhaps. The highly civilized Minoans do come close to Plato's description of the Atlanteans, but almost nothing else about them matches. Plato described Atlantis as an island continent the size of Libya and Asia combined. Santorini hardly fits this description. It's also not outside the Pillars of Heracles, if we assume that Plato was referring to the Strait of Gibraltar. And while a great volcano did destroy the Minoan outpost, it erupted only 900 years before Plato wrote his dialogues, not 9,000. There are pieces, elements of the story that work beautifully here. And there are pieces of it that just don't seem to apply at all. And it's a 50-50 kind of a thing. And so nothing wins. <laughs> it's nothing dominates. You can't just take bits of a story and dismiss other bits of the story to make it work. But for believers, hope always springs eternal. And one man's faith in the legendary land of Troy, the site of the Trojan War, still inspires many to search for Atlantis. In 1873, German adventurer Heinrich Schliemann unearthed ancient Troy, proving that Homer's epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, were at least partly based on fact. George Erickson points out that many people thought Schliemann was crazy for following clues from a popular myth, but look at the result. I think that what Heinrich Schliemann showed all of us is that you need not believe the status quo. You can keep seeking answers that make sense to you. But the skeptics believe that answers must be supported by hard evidence. My question is, if the Atlanteans came here, why didn't they leave any real trace of their origins, of their advent, of their boats, or any of their seafaring technology? The mystery remains unsolved. Perhaps Plato simply crafted the ultimate morality tale. Or perhaps there is still a lost civilization somewhere out there waiting to be found. It's quite possible that Plato was writing a morality tale rather than history, and that he is using the story of Atlantis to illustrate a point. And this is what happens if you uh, get a little too big for your britches. I believe Atlantis is a true story. And I think probably within the next 10 years, we're gonna be turning up new evidence about Atlantis that's gonna be just absolutely stunning. Until somebody finds something that you can hold in your hand or take a picture of and say, this could not have come from anywhere else but Atlantis. Until that moment, I don't believe a word of it. <laughs>